Like many of the most interesting stories in theme park history, our tale begins with Michael Eisner in the 1990s. He came into the Disney company at a time when the theme parks were stagnating both creatively and financially. He sought to reinvigorate them with something he called the Disney Decade, a series of big plans to not just improve every existing park, but add multiple new ones around the world. Part of this initiative to grow the parks was to try to expand their target audience. Eisen noticed when visiting Disney World with his family that his teenage son was often bored by what the Disney parks had to offer, so he sought to add more attractions and elements that could appeal to teens and young adults. Thus, one of the biggest trends from the Disney decade was trying to be hip and groovy. Is groovy something kids say? I'm just not as up to date on what's radical as I used to be. Should I try saying yeet in this video? I used to be with it, but then they changed what it was. Now what I'm with isn't it, and what's it seems weird and scary to me. It'll happen to you. No way, man. We're gonna keep on rocking forever. 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 Some of the rides built during this era have gone down in history as some of the greatest that Disney has ever built, like Tao Teo or Indiana Jones Adventure. Others had more of a mixed reception like Alien Encounter, where fans have turned it into a cult classic while others just know it as that thing that scarred many young children for life. Still, other attempts at being trendy led to disasters like the Journey into Your Imagination revamp, or the Tiki Room redo that was so bad, God set it on fire to save us from it. Nowhere was this initiative to target older audiences more clear than California Adventure. Between the more cynical and sarcastic tone of the park to the almost total lack of anything based on animated movies or characters, the original version of California Adventure had a lot of effort put into it to be more adult focused. This is most evident in the Hollywood Pictures backlot section of the park, which gave us the infamous disaster piece of Superstar Limo, the ride that's basically the theme park equivalent of the room. How much is it? It'll be $18. Here you go. Keep the change. Hi, Doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye. Being a studio-themed land, they knew guests would be expecting a big stage show, but with the initiative to avoid cartoons and classic Disney stuff, they didn't want to just do a stage show telling the story of a popular film. That wouldn't be trendy or edgy enough. Forget cartoons, we need late 90s pop music and shiny silver wigs. The attempts during the Disney decade to attract all the audiences to the Disney parks led to many great things and many terrible things. In the case of Steps in Time, it led to one of the worst and most baffling things ever seen inside a Disney park. One of the weirdest things about Steps in Time's history is that what guests saw on opening day of California Adventure was actually the third, completely different version of the show, and each progressive version was worse than the one before it and made in less time. The first version of the show designed for the Hyperion Theater was Disney's On the Record. Details about this are sort of scarce, but it did inspire a traveling show a few years later, so we can assume it would have been similar. A very simple musical review show with four performers and a simple set. The story was about a group of singers recording an album of Disney cover songs. So, audiences would watch the group sing covers of Disney songs. Here's the timestamp for where I start that description of the show. I understand it has a very complex and dense plot. Listening to the explanation a second time might clear up some of your confusion. The touring show version of On The Record was more or less seen by critics as good enough, which is the best any version of the show has ever been received. Eisner didn't like On The Record, at least not for the Hyperion Theater. He told the Imagineers to yeet what they had and essentially remake it from the ground up. As best I can tell, they only had about two or three months to work on this new version. Also, do you notice how I used yeet in a sentence? I'm pretty proud of that. Anyways, the Imagineers kept the basics the same, a musical review with covers of Disney songs and very little plot. This second version of the show was the first iteration to be called Steps in Time, and for this beta version they added extravagant dance numbers, a bigger cast, and more of a modern twist to the music. The quality of these dances and remixes was questionable at times. Some were pretty great though, especially the opening number performed by Eden Espinosa. She got a start in the Disney parks with shows like this, but she went on to be Elphaba and Wicket on Broadway, and even made her way back to Disney later as the voice of Cassandra in Tangled Ever After. So there was some serious talent in this show.
Unfortunately, most of the other numbers in the show aren't anything special, and they tend to fall flat rather than keeping the crowds excited for the full 22 minute show. Though, to its credit, this version's romantic performance of A Whole New World is a duet between two fully grown adults who are both above the legal age of consent. That might seem like an odd thing for me to point out, but this show's history is gonna go to some weird places, so buckle up. Steps in Time 1.0 was seen by guests at the media preview days for California Adventure, which meant Disney was able to get feedback directly from the guests, who all told them it was rather boring. And it's tough to blame them. Almost half the big finale dance number had the stage completely dark, so guests would focus on a montage of movie clips. It wasn't bad, but it definitely wasn't the best show. Especially for the setting of being inside a theme park. These complaints prompted another reimagining this time with only a couple of weeks before the park's grand opening. Imagineers had less than a month to add a story and some comedy to the show. But wait, there's more! One of the biggest criticisms of California Adventure as a whole from these preview days was a lack of things for kids to do and whimsical Disney charm. So this hasty update also had a turn to the show that was specifically made for an older audience as a part of Eisner's initiative into something aimed at kids instead. So there was a lot of pressure put on this update, considering they only had roughly the amount of time a middle school romance lasts, to fix the show and add all of these new elements. Nothing can possibly go wrong. Uh, possibly go wrong. <laughs> that's the first thing that's ever gone wrong. On paper, this updated version of the show should have been a hit. The new story that they added was about a fairy godmother taking a kid on a magical adventure to learn the importance of dreams, along the way getting swept up in grand dance numbers based around some of the best songs in Disney history, performed by someone who would go on to be one of the best voices on Broadway. All the elements for a truly amazing show for Disney were there. So what happened? Well, there were two main problems. First off, they didn't have a lot of time for the change between the original version and this one. They were able to add the new characters and some dialogue in between songs, they didn't have time to completely redo the show. Most of the songs had to be kept almost identical other than finding ways to add the new leads into the choreography. This caused the story to start to fall apart. The name, Steps in Time, no longer made sense for a show about fairy godmother and following dreams, since Steps in Time, as a song, or just as a phrase, has nothing to do with either of those concepts. Of the seven songs in the show, only three of them were about dreams. And of those three, one of them had a moral that dreams were bad and following them is wrong. The story of the show and the show itself were at odds with each other, which led to everything feeling disjointed. Even someone who knows nothing about the history of the show and has no way of knowing that this is basically exactly what happened, it still would feel like the plot was just slapped onto the show with no thought last minute. There was another major problem though. The kid was actually a kid. The lead character was played by an actual child actor, and as far as I can tell, this is the only time a Disney park has ever done this. To his credit, the kid isn't bad. He's no Stranger Things level of talent, but as far as child actors go, he's pretty good. But he's still a kid. Beyond just the weirdness of seeing an actual child on stage distracting from the show, the choreography had to be kept simple so even a child could do it, because again, an actual child had to do it. This led to the creation of a few of my new favorite dance moves. Leaning side to side. Aggressive walking. And my personal favorite to bust out at the club, sitting down. Again, I'm not saying this is the kid's fault. He can dance if he wants to. He can leave his friends behind. Because his friends don't dance, and if they don't dance, then they ain't no friends of mine. But I get the sense that he was meant to blend into the background during most of these numbers based on the choreography. Which is why he mostly just walks around or stands to the side. But for some reason, the brightest spotlight is almost always on him instead of where the actual dancers are. Again, the show is at odds with itself. The lighting tells us to focus one place, the blocking tells us to focus somewhere else. The same way the story tells us one thing is to focus, but the choice of music tells us a different thing is to focus. Everything is falling apart because it's competing with itself. Aside from the kid, there's another new lead character at the cast, the fairy godmother, who was sometimes played by Eden Espinosa. 
This character was clearly meant to be like Robin Williams' genie, breaking the fourth wall, telling snappy one-liners, making fun references, but the genie is a tough character to replicate. I used to be a sorceress, but it doesn't pay and there's no help benefit, so... <laughs> I could go on a whole deep dive as to why Robin Williams worked so well in Aladdin when so many movies have tried and failed to replicate the character's success and charm. Even movies that use Robin Williams. But there's really no need to because I can sum it up really simply. If they're funny, this kind of character is great. If they're not funny, this kind of character is annoying. There you go, no need to look up a 45 minute long video essay about why Robin Williams and Aladdin is funny. I, I covered it. We're good. We, you can move on. If they're funny, yay. Not funny, boo. Anyways, the fairy godmother isn't funny. Give me a sec, I'm kinda new to this whole fairy gig. Some great acting, but the script was not polished and the jokes didn't land most of the time, especially since the kid seems to hate her for most of the show, giving them a terrible dynamic. The fairy godmother annoys the kid on accident, the kid then responds by annoying her on purpose. That's the character dynamic that's supposed to anchor the entire experience. All the characters being annoyed at each other. Which just leads to the audience getting double annoyed. I for one think you are fabulous. And there are weird things in every scene, even beyond just a little story that Sella added. From the shadow puppet parents in the opening, to the incredibly dated costumes, to the couch with headlights, to the finale performance of Steps in Time to make zero effort to even pretend it connects to the rest of the show or the story. Every single scene has something bizarre in it, or something that just plain doesn't work. Even the weaker parts of the original version have creative new ways added to make them worse. Like Monstro trying to eat a child in the middle of the Under the Sea performance. Though no moment in the entire show is as uncomfortable or poorly executed as when the adult fairy godmother sings a duet of a whole new world with the actual child. A grown woman singing one of Disney's most romantic songs ever with the literal little boy. They do their best to make it seem like she is talking about actual new worlds she is going to show them on their journey to learn about dreams, even though as far as to have the two leads stand as far away from each other as possible during most of the song. But you can't really change the meaning of such an iconic song. I get that they were running short on time and didn't want to cut more than they have to from the original show because they didn't have time to replace it with new stuff, but this should have been cut. This was a huge misstep. The type of problem that should have been obvious but slipped through the cracks and into the final show because everything was rushed and slapped together. In trying to fix the issues with the original version, they turned Steps in Time into a show that is its own worst enemy, constantly contradicting itself and creating new problems. It's a show that wound up not working on basically any level. And guests didn't hide how much they disliked this show, and it closed after only 8 months. Even Superstar Limo lasted longer before it closed forever. The Hyperion Theater didn't stay closed for long though. Ironically, after everything that had happened with the development of Steps in Time, it was replaced by a musical review with no story. <laughs> the Power of Blast was an adaptation of a temporary show that played in Epcot, which was in turn based on the Broadway show Blast, and it was a hit, and matched the more mature tone Eisner was hoping for but it was always meant to be temporary and guests were still asking for something more classically Disney for the park. So a little over a year later, the Hyperion Theater got its most iconic show to date, Aladdin, a musical spectacular. 
It checked all the boxes Disney wanted while still pleasing general audiences. The Broadway caliber show felt more mature than the average theme park offering, and the script for the genie was updated frequently, so the show would always stay trendy. OMG, hashtag ugly sultan. <laughs> <laughs> Tweet! If it was still going on today, he'd probably tell Aladdin to yeet Jafar. Do you want to build a snowman? <laughs> Aladdin opened just under two years after the park did, and yet it was the fourth show to be performed in front of guests in that theater. Fifth, if you count on the record. That's an insane number of shows for one theater in such a short time in a theme park. Steps in Time was a baffling show with a truly baffling history. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. I have links in the description if you'd like to learn more, and let me know in the comments what baffling history you'd like to see me do next. I have something fun planned for my next baffling history video, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.